Cool. All right. So how many of you have already used coroutines like, at all, just in general? Excellent. Cool. So there are a lot of uh, talks on coroutines that uh, the creators of uh, Kotlin coroutines uh, have given at various conferences. And uh, those talks are like really amazing. There is a lot of depth in them. I'm still learning coroutines. Uh, but for this talk, I decided to compare Kotlin coroutines to other languages. So I looked at those other languages very briefly, uh, and I can tell you I'm an expert on those languages, even though I'm not an expert on Kotlin coroutines. So some of the things that happened recently, uh, Kotlin 1.3 became final, uh, and uh, the coroutines uh, got out of the experimental stage. So that uh, key, uh, word experimental was scaring a lot of people previously. So some people didn't want to use them in uh, production. Uh, but JetBrains have been really actively using them everywhere in all of their products, including uh, the front end and the back end projects. So the coroutines are uh, pretty cool. And um, so especially if you have used them, you can uh, see how they compare to the things that you had available to you previously. So some of the things that uh, people uh, bring up frequently is the contrast between the old style, the callback uh, style of programming, and the resulting uh, callback hell. Right? It's not necessarily, this particular example is not necessarily super terrible, it's fairly manageable, like, but this is an example that I created for this, uh, to, uh, for this slide. So it is designed to fit on a single slide. The real code may be a little bit more hairy, like, and uh, one of the things that we all know, the code evolves. You cannot just write something once and it's perfect forever, unless it is Haskell, then they write it very slowly uh, and it is perfect. Um, so how do you fix something like this? Well, I mean, it's not necessarily broken, but it may be more difficult to maintain. So with coroutines, we uh, can write the code that is a little bit more sequential looking, so it's a little bit uh, easier uh, to understand. Um, and uh, some of the machinery is hidden uh, from us. So the compiler does the heavy lifting of transforming our code so that uh, the code suspends where necessary. And in Kotlin, one of the design choices that was made is to uh, just use a single keyword, suspend, to mark the functions that can suspend. And so then there is a whole lot of rules around that, right? So like you have a single rule and lots of uh, corollaries from that. So one of the rules is in order to call a suspending function, you already need to be um, inside a coroutine. And so that's why we have the whole concept of the coroutine builders, right? Because to transition from the non-suspending world to the suspending world, you need some sort of a bridge. So there are uh, coroutine builders like uh, launch, await, run blocking, and so on. Lots of different ones uh, that are meant for various uh, scenarios. And um, some of the unsung heroes of those uh, coroutine builders are um, the things that allow us to build sequences and iterators. All right, so the classic iterator may, may uh, look something like this. You just implement the iterator interface and you have to implement two methods, has next and uh, next. So nothing particularly complex, right? And if you want to um, create something that um, allows you to iterate over a range, in this case, this is an inclusive range, starting from the begin, uh, ending with the end, uh, so this is a very straightforward implementation, not uh, really particularly complex. And uh, when you uh, iterate uh, using the for loop, it prints exactly what you would expect, right? An integer from 7 to 11. Uh, but you can also uh, transform this into a coroutine. And this is something that uh, stuck with me when I was listening to one of the uh, talks from um, Roman Elizaro. So he said that, okay, instead of creating a class, I can write a coroutine. And so this is exactly one of those examples. So instead of having a whole class, you can just create a coroutine that builds a sequence, right? So it's just like having the full class versus a single coroutine is not necessarily the metric you're going for, but uh, the consistency of code that you achieve, because a lot of times you'll be writing the code that looks more similar uh, to uh, the other parts of your code. That makes it a little bit easier to maintain. So this is an equivalent. Um, um, and of course, like I just realized now that I am cheating by using a Kotlin range in order to do the, uh, the sequence, you know, but you get the idea. So I, should, I probably should have written the for loop that explicitly iterates over the number. 
So the coroutines are really great at um, returning a single value, or in this case, uh, performing the sequences, but uh, one of the things that uh, is technically still experimental, so hopefully they will become uh, more widely available soon, are uh, the notion of channels. So the channels allow us to uh, communicate between two different um, processes or different parts of our application. And uh, the channels are modeled after the channels in uh, Go. So it's a very similar concept. Uh, so there is a concept of the buffered uh, channel. So if you specify the number in the channels uh, constructor as a parameter, then it will create a, um, a buffer channel. Otherwise, it's a rendezvous channel and so on. So like there is a lot of uh, depth uh, to the channels. But uh, uh, to use a channel, you can use the same for loop construct, right? So like as you uh, used for sequences. So in the last line, I am iterating over the channel and uh, printing out the results. And whenever the channel closes, so when the um, channel is closed, then that uh, particular for loop finishes. Or it can be indefinite. So like it could be something that is similar to an event loop. So I can uh, iterate indefinitely, keep sending the information on a regular basis, and the listener is going to continue uh, getting the information from it. All right. um, and uh, the channel is generalized to things like uh, pipelines. So here's another example of uh, writing the range. So like again, like instead of using the uh, build sequence and yield, I'm using produce and send. So now the, behind the scenes there is a channel. But if we uh, take a step back again, we realize that there isn't really such a construct as a primitive channel in Kotlin. So channels, await, yield, launch, all of those different constructs, you know, coroutine builders and so on, all of those are just library functions. So Kotlin 1.3 supports coroutines out of the box, and that gives you the suspend keyword. But if you want to do anything interesting with uh, coroutines, you have to use the coroutine standard library. So like, and that's, like I see that as a, uh, like uh, th that question frequently in like various Slack channels or on Stack Overflow, just like, why I thought that they were final, so like I can use them. Well, that's the difference, right? So the uh, uh, intrinsic machinery is included in the language, but all of the convenience functions are um, not. So um, one other uh, thing that uh, frequently uh, comes up in um, the discussions of coroutines is the notion of a future of some sort. Uh, and in uh, the Kotlin coroutines, that future is called the deferred. That is future promise. Like there are many different names in other uh, languages and libraries. There's also something called task. Uh, so the deferred uh, allows you to um, use this. Uh, well, you, you can use the other kinds of futures. So there are other languages that uh, use them in many other libraries. But uh, currently, in retrofit, if you wanted to use them um, in your Kotlin code, if you use the coroutine adapter, call adapter, then the deferred is probably the cleaner way to do this. You can also use the call, and then you can write your own uh, converter from that, but uh, this is one of the approaches. And so the reason that we uh, need to talk about the futures is because it turns out that a lot of languages uh, build their coroutine support on top of futures in their respective languages. So there, so there is a very strong connection uh, between the futures and uh, coroutines. Right, so when I uh, started out thinking about uh, this talk, I tried to imagine what languages support uh, coroutines, right? And so out of the box, like, so which, what languages do you think are supported? Like obviously C Sharp, right, because in Android, we recently have been doing a lot of .NET programming, right? So MVVM, um, coroutines, things like that. So this is a, the list of uh, usual suspects, right? So these are the languages that you would expect. Uh, we talk about these languages frequently. So my colleagues who have been doing the front end, uh, they're super excited about uh, the uh, async await support in ECMAScript and uh, or JavaScript. Uh, so it's um, like pretty cool. Uh, technically, among these languages, the one language that doesn't have coroutines is Swift. So there is a proposal um, out there, but they have not been implemented. Uh, but that proposal actually has a lot of really interesting uh, discussions. So like the design of the uh, coroutines in general, so like it, it, it can be very um, informative if you're trying to understand where the coroutines came from. So then I started uh, digging a little bit deeper and I realized that I cannot cover all these languages because there are way more languages that have the native coroutine support 
or some sort of support in the libraries. And uh, curiously, even Java has uh, support for the coroutines uh, through the libraries. So there are a couple of different approaches. Some um, libraries do the bytecode transformation, uh, but other uh, libraries just uh, create an API. So it kind of look, looks like the futures slash observables API, uh, but uh, it gives you the coroutine semantics. So the coroutines have been famously described as a more general ca uh, case of, of uh, subroutines. So subroutines is just a subset of those. And so then the reason for that is because the uh, coroutines do everything that the subroutines do and then a little bit more. So the typical subroutines are shown here in uh, green. Um, it can be called, so you can pass it some parameters and you can get the result value out of the uh, subroutine. And then the execution of the caller continues. But with uh, coroutines, uh, there is an additional uh, two features that uh, they can do. So you can see them here, so suspend and resume. So you can uh, see the kind of like the little summary here. So the coroutine can be suspended and its execution can be resumed at a later point. But beyond this, it also turns out that you can resume the execution of the coroutine uh, from somebody other than the original caller. So you don't have to resume the coroutine from exactly the same place. It can be resumed somewhere else. Uh, and this is why we have things like um, the different uh, dispatchers, right? So you can uh, launch uh, a coroutine, so uh, you can create the, uh, launch your code, and uh, some of that will execute on the I.O. Um, dispatcher and some other code will execute on the main uh, dispatcher, right? And so you don't have to uh, separate the code out necessarily. So like with callbacks, typically that's what you would do. You would design your API in such a way uh, as to indicate that the callback, this particular callback needs to execute on the uh, UI thread. You would annotate it with the uh, at UI. Uh, possibly you would also enable the strict mode in your Android application so that way uh, you can catch things uh, quickly and so on. But with coroutines, you can write everything uh, sequentially. So like in the manner that you are uh, very familiar with from like the very first Hello World uh, program that you wrote. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift gears a tiny bit and ask you, do you know this person, Tony Hoare? So who went to uh, the effective Kotlin talk yesterday? Like a few of you, right? So, unfortunately, there was no audio, but in 2009 at uh, QCon, he famously said that I made a billion dollar mistake, right? And so, okay, do you know what else this person did? Okay, so, yeah, he did introduce the null pointers to the world, right? But you can't just introduce a null pointer out of thin air. You cannot be just like, oh, 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 let's do null pointers. Like, that's my contribution to computer science. He was working on something that was actually um, very important. So he built a couple of compilers, I think like Algol uh, 60 and Algol W. And so he uh, created um, the notion of references and he wanted to make sure that the references are always correct. But, you know, he, I guess the mathematical mind was just like, well, for completeness, like there should be a null reference. And so he, and it was so easy to implement, so he went ahead and uh, introduced that. But that's not the only thing he did. Like, in fact, he was, um, he was very prolific and uh, he uh, was knighted. And so you, sometimes you will see uh, the papers, like in the papers, his name is listed as C-A-R, whore, right? So, uh, like, and at first, when I did the original uh, checking, I was like, is that the same person? Is it a different person? Like, maybe like, you know, like they just happened to share the last name, same person. Um, well, yeah, so infamous for the null. Uh, pointer, but he also got the Turing Award because he did things like uh, quick sort. I'm pretty sure many of you had to implement that if you did computer science, or if you interviewed at some places, uh, like the, usually the hiring managers brush up on the quick sort before they interview the candidate because they don't remember it, you know. Um, but why do I bring up this person? Like, well, yes, this talk is partially about Kotlin, and so we uh, frequently uh, like to brag to our colleagues who still have to write Java alone that we have now safety. And then that's where that whole, you know, like the billion dollar mistake, uh, be with, uh, with a, a billion with a B, like three comma club, you know. Uh, but uh, the, uh, 
the thing that is relevant for this talk is that he wrote a paper on communicating sequential processes. So like apparently this is an extremely influential paper. And uh, Rob Pike, the, one of the co-creators of Go, programming language, uh, credits this specific paper saying like, this is exactly what we implement. So this is very important. I uh, started reading the paper, it was written um, a while ago. And uh, so it's uh, like the syntax is a little bit uh, awkward and weird, you know, so um, Kotlin has a nicer syntax. So if you are using the channels in uh, Kotlin, you are effectively uh, using this uh, person's uh, contribution to computer science. All right, then continuing our uh, segment on the heroes of uh, computer science, have you heard of this person, Conway? Well, if you're thinking that he did the Conway's uh, Game of Life, uh, it's a different Conway. So like in this case, there were two separate Conways who made significant contributions. Uh, so this Conway uh, came up with Conway's Law, right? And so the Conway's Law, if you've read the Mythical Man Month, that's where the uh, term Conway's Law was coined. Uh, so he previously wrote the paper, uh, and it indicates that the, like a lot of times, the systems designed by organizations will mimic their organizational structure. So if you have uh, five teams working on a compiler, and then another uh, group like that has uh, four teams working on a compiler, they will come up with, respectively, a five-pass compiler and a four-pass compiler, right? And so that just was the thing, you know? So it, um, it just so happened that um, it uh, was turned into a law. But the reason that we talk about him today is, again, related to coroutines. So he is the person who invented the term coroutines. So he needed uh, to use them in, back in 1958. And uh, there was one other person who uh, co-invented this idea, but that person didn't publish, so I won't even mention the name. All right. A surprising entry in the discussion on coroutines, COBOL. So how many of you have written COBOL code? Wow, I am surprised, that's amazing. So there are a few people who have written COBOL code. So one important thing to remember is that COBOL is a very old language. It's one of the earliest high-level human uh, readable uh, programming languages uh, that, well, you didn't have to write assembly in order to achieve this. Uh, unfortunately, to achieve something like this at the time, so, so, so many people didn't think it was even possible for a human to achieve this. So the COBOL compilers back then, or oh, the original compilers, required nine passes. Um, and if you remember the machines back then, some of them, well, I think they actually scaled down from the size of the stadium. So you've seen the AT&T park here, right? So imagine a computer that size in the uh, 40s, the ENIAC, and then it shrinks down to something very compact, like the size of this room maybe, like a very small computer. Uh, you only need 60 of them in the entire world, famous words by IBM. Um, well, they use punch cards and tapes, right? The tapes were uh, magnetic media was more expensive and so on. And so uh, trying to do compilation required multiple passes. So that meant that you had to carry the stacks of the punch cards, insert them into the computer. It uh, reads them in, performs its work, uh, prints out some more punch cards or punches holes in the punch cards. Then you load that for the next pass. And so it's a very slow process. And at the time, people speculated that it would probably take the compiler compiler in order to be able to write something that can perform all of this work in one pass. So they were thinking about metaprogramming back then. Uh, well, Conway decided that, that he couldn't wait for that. And so he ended up writing uh, the coroutines um, in assembly at the time. And so the coroutines, um, well, so they had the same features. So like in addition to the uh, return uh, pointer, it also had the resume pointer. It's right? so like when you return from a subroutine, uh, it's uh, like you get, uh, well, when you call a subroutine or a function, uh, you push the return pointer so you know where to jump back to. Well, with the coroutines, you also uh, indicate like, well, this is the return position, this is the resume, right? Um, and so the reason that this was important for compilers is because it made it possible for the different passes of the compiler to talk to each other, and that's the, um, you save some space, you also saved several passes. So he succeeded in creating a single pass COBOL compiler. Um, and what we're benefiting from today is much more efficient compilers, right? So the coroutines made the compilers uh, more effective, more efficient, and now the compilers are making us more effective and efficient. 
So I'll talk briefly about uh, some of the modern languages that use the uh, coroutines. So C Sharp famously uses the async await syntax. It's one of the uh, earlier modern languages that used this syntax. I actually don't even know if they were the first ones to use the async await syntax, but uh, they definitely uh, are one of the most popular languages. So the typical example looks like this. This is from uh, Microsoft's own uh, site, the documentation on the uh, async await. And you can see that it is very explicit. So we use the async modifier to indicate that this is an asynchronous function. Another thing that we need to do is we need to indicate a future type. So uh, C Sharp uses task and we wrap the int in it. And one other important thing, we need to use the async keyword uh, to, uh, like as a convention, right? So like you don't have to, but it's kind of like in, uh, I guess like it's a, it's a good practice to indicate this is an asynchronous function because that way when you're actually trying to use it, so like at the bottom, uh, you, you will remember, it's like, oh yeah, I think we're missing a wait. So we need to insert the await there. So you don't have to use a wait. You can also uh, use the dot result, but the difference is that the dot result is uh, blocking whereas a wait is suspending. So uh, if you are writing a lot of suspending code, you probably want to prefer to use the uh, await, but if for some reason this code is running in the background, right, in a separate thread, then using the dot result might be the correct way to approach this. Maybe you have some legacy code that you're trying to integrate with, and so like you're inserting the call into uh, the async await code, you know, something like this might work. All right, enough about C Sharp. Let's talk about Lua, that's much more fun because this language is used in, oh, actually, how many of you have heard of Lua? Right? Oh, okay, cool, a lot of you. So lang uh, this language is uh, very easy to embed in other uh, systems, apparently. Like I have not really programmed in Lua, so like I'm just like, this is what I heard. Uh, and uh, they took a very interesting approach to the coroutine. So the coroutines look like uh, function calls, right? So instead of having a separate um, keyword, you just uh, create the coroutine using this uh, coroutine library, and they behave in a very similar way. So when you create the uh, coroutine, so like behind the scenes, they are tied to threads. Um, and, uh, but you can also see uh, the state of the coroutine and so on. So a slightly more uh, complex example. Uh, so like as uh, you, uh, you can continue the uh, coroutine, so you resume the coroutine and it performs the next step after the yield. Um, and uh, eventually, once you uh, finish the coroutine, then there is nothing else left in it, so the coroutine is uh, finished. So, like, I don't have the line there, but the status would be the coroutine is now dead. Um, so the coroutines were a fairly new addition to the Lua language at one point that they did not get added to the World of Warcraft. Anybody played World of Warcraft? Uh, just a couple of people? Okay, remember the auctioneer, right? So apparently the auctioneer had to jump through the hoops in order to get around the fact that uh, Lua bundled with World of uh, Warcraft did not have coroutines, right? So because you need to perform something without blocking the main thread and everything. Uh, so fortunately in 2.x, I think it's like 2.06 or something like that, uh, they added support for the coroutines. So now the auctioneer uses the coroutines uh, very uh, like effectively. All right, now let's focus on Go. So uh, it, th uh, there is a nice uh, talk uh, by Rob Pike about Go and uh, the concurrency versus parallelism. Uh, so uh, the Go routines specifically focus on uh, trying to support uh, parallelism. In the talk, he uh, discusses uh, debugging uh, like some code that was um, that had like millions of coroutines running at the same time and like, so yeah, so the scale is fairly big um, and they use them uh, like a lot on the back end. Um, well, one interesting thing about the Go routines is that you do not need to add any sort of a modifier to the function. You just sort of write the function in a normal way and you can call it either uh, in a regular way as like the say hello, or you can also uh, call it with a Go uh, keyword. So like that uh, causes uh, that, uh, the Go, uh, say world to be executed uh, in parallel. Um, so uh, in order to communicate between the coroutines, Go uses the channels. So this is where the inspiration for the channels uh, library in the uh, Kotlin coroutines came from. 
so to create a channel, you would uh, use the make um, function. So you would, uh, create a channel and then you can start using it. And uh, to read and write from the channel, you use this arrow operator, right? So the direction of the arrow indicates uh, where the, um, like the data is flowing from. So is it going into the channel or is it flowing out of the channel? And if you specify the size uh, of the channel, then the channel uh, becomes buffered, right? So like, and that, uh, so yeah, we saw the buffered um, channel example earlier. All right. Uh, and of course, uh, there is one other connection. So uh, the, we uh, can use the range uh, keyword in order to iterate over the information from the channel, right? And we can close the channel. And so this is something that uh, we will see uh, next when we uh, look at the, some of the, the evolution of the Python support for coroutines. So uh, Python uh, had this uh, very weird yield keyword. I remember many years ago, I was like trying to understand what it did. It was kind of like very surprising. Uh, turns out uh, that is where the coroutines evolved from, but it took a little while. Uh, so the yield um, keyword allowed you to uh, return the execution back to the caller. So you can kind of like uh, kick it back and forth. And uh, of course, it was used for uh, things like uh, creating the uh, iterators, or they call them generators, right? So a very convenient way to clean up some of the code. Uh, then in Python 2.5, uh, the send um, statement was added, and it allowed uh, you to send the data back into the coroutine. So you can start communicating ba uh, back and forth. Uh, Python 3.3 added yield from, which allowed you to uh, create uh, a generator out of an iterator. So, and then that became very important because like that way, now you can start uh, chaining uh, the generators together. And so like that, again, like resulted in the additional affordances, which eventually uh, led to uh, the creation of the async await. So like Python 3.4 added the async IO library so that you could perform the asynchronous IO. And then the async await keywords finally added in Python 3.5. So here's the simple yield example. So this just generates an infinite uh, sequence of uh, integers. Uh, well, semi-infinite, I guess. Well, in case of Python, the integers can go on for a while. So, uh, so uh, this is an example of the yield and send. So we can uh, send the specific data. You can see that the uh, line result equals yield. So when we send the data from outside of the coroutine, so we can continue sending uh, the data into the coroutine. So it's not just when we call the coroutine the first time when we uh, can pass the data into it. Uh, so the yield from is used in um, code like this. So that these two uh, are equivalent. So you can either uh, perform uh, the for loop on the iterator and then yield, or you can do yield from, and that achieves the same thing. And so this is a fairly uh, big insight, right? Because if you can yield something from the iterator, that means the next time the iterator has something, it will be sent back to the caller of the coroutine, so you can do some work on it, and then it'll send you the next one, right? And so then there is a certain similarity between the iterators and futures. So like imagine, like if a future is like an iterator that just has one element in it, right? And it might get returned at a later point. So uh, in uh, Python 3.4, um, they added the, uh, this um, modifier. I actually forget exactly what they call it, this like annotation looking thing, asyncio.coroutine. Uh, and the reason that they did this is because uh, they didn't want all of the generators that were using the yield code to automatically become coroutines. That, uh, because maybe the developers of that generator did not, uh, did not anticipate that uh, generator to be used as a coroutine. So they added the explicit um, annotation. And uh, in uh, a later version of Python, they added the async await. So, but if you look at them uh, closely, then you will discover that the uh, uh, bytecode generated is extremely similar. So one difference uh, between these two examples is actually uh, this, right? So if you use the yield from, uh, that you, uh, then you get the yield from iterator. Whereas if you use the await, uh, then you're getting the uh, get awaitable, right? So there's a slight, uh, slight difference, and uh, it also uh, implies that you cannot use uh, the await keyword unless you uh, modify your function with the async, um, and you cannot uh, use yield inside the async functions. 
So it's like slight uh, separation, but a lot of the machinery behind the scenes is uh, very similar. All right, now we'll talk about JavaScript and we will specifically compare uh, JavaScript uh, promises and um, coroutines. So uh, yeah, just like a little brief 101. So async await work exactly, like in, very, in a manner very similar to uh, the way they work in uh, Python and C Sharp. And uh, so some of the things that uh, you might want to do with uh, whenever you're writing uh, the asynchronous code. So like in promises, you would write something like this. So you would chain the calls, you know, use the dot then uh, function. Uh, but with coroutines, you can make it a little bit uh, cleaner, a little bit briefer, right? And um, so some of the challenges um, with um, trying to use the promise code is uh, like uh, trying to handle uh, errors, right? So like you, you can use the try catch for regular uh, code, sequential code. But if you are doing anything with promises, so now you need to handle the error state slightly differently. So here's one example, right? So like, and you have two separate uh, catch uh, blocks. So one is actually the catch in the language. The other one is a dot catch function, which uh, catches the errors separately. Like if you're using Rx Java in subscribe, you can supply both the success and the error uh, handlers, right? So uh, again, this is absolutely doable. It uh, solved a lot of problems. But if you uh, prefer to write code that looks like this, then this potentially might be a little bit more uh, readable. Uh, then um, trying to use some of the built-in language structures like loops and uh, conditionals uh, becomes a little bit uh, easier if you are uh, using coroutines. So here's an example of transforming that into the uh, regular um, async await uh, style, right? So, um, and this one is uh, something, I guess, it may be occasionally useful for you to be able to uh, like make the code like this a little bit cleaner. So we're using some intermediate values in order to call uh, the, like we, we go from promise one to promise two, uh, and then the result of both of those. Uh, so the promise two needs the result of promise one, and promise three needs the results of both of those. Uh, so this uh, chaining becomes a little bit harder to read, whereas this one is potentially a little bit simpler. Okay, um, so at some point, the compiler needs to do uh, some heavy lifting for us in order to transform the code that is written this way so that it does exactly the right thing, right? So because the coroutine, whenever we use the, uh, whenever we suspend the execution, right? So like the await in languages like C Sharp and JavaScript indicates that this is where uh, this function can suspend. So when we suspend the execution, that means that the execution returns to the caller. So like maybe some other coroutine or thousands or millions of coroutines can execute and then eventually come back here, right? And um, so there are several uh, talks that discuss the internals of the coroutine. So the compiler performs the transformation. And you may have heard that the coroutines in Kotlin are like a state machine, right? So you convert the uh, code. So the compiler inserts some additional code. So um, like different suspend points become the uh, different um, labels that you can jump to, right? And um, so uh, in order to go a little bit deeper into that, well, it's kind of like comparison to another language. So we're going to look at C++, right? If you've programmed in C++, you know that C++ has everything, right? Because there are a lot of uh, really big libraries. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are tons of C++ implementations. So obviously Boost has an opinion. So there are a couple of them, in fact. Um, and there are several others. But uh, in uh, like a couple of years ago, uh, the C++ coroutines uh, technical specification um, was uh, drafted. So uh, they started uh, coming up with uh, uh, something that can be added to the standard itself and something that would be supported by the compiler. And um, last year, I guess, yeah, 2017, uh, it finally happened. So now there is a coroutines TS and uh, they are already implemented in Clang and uh, Microsoft Visual C++. So some of the design principles that uh, the team was uh, pursuing uh, uh, to make them uh, scalable. And uh, so like that's again, a billion uh, coroutines with a B um, and efficient and so on. So uh, the futures, uh, like again, so the futures do play a role here, but one of the things that the team noted is that there is an overhead related to futures. 
because you need to uh, perform like locking and, and you need to uh, uh, perform some memory allocations and things like that. Uh, just a little side note, so you probably heard that threads are expensive, right? And so like one of the reasons that the threads are expensive is because each thread needs to have its own stack. And so like when you, whenever you create a stack, you need to make the stack uh, that's big enough for, you know, so that you avoid the stack overflow too soon. Um, and so yeah, there is a little bit of that overhead, but with coroutines, they can run on different uh, stacks, and they, in fact, they do occasionally. So there are different implementations. So there are stackless coroutines, and then um, the coroutines that do use stacks. So sometimes they use the little side uh, data structure and allocate on the heap and so on. But um, yeah, coming back to this. So um, the futures can be expensive, uh, even though the compiler can occasionally eliminate some of that uh, complexity. Uh, like it's still, in a more general case, um, it may be a little bit harder to reason about this. So uh, the example that uh, the C++ coroutine uh, designers uh, were demonstrating is something like this, right? So you start with a simple TCP reader. And so like, again, since we're dealing with the IO and specifically reading something over the network, even though this is a loopback, uh, you don't want to block this. You know, you want to perform the code uh, asynchronously somehow. And a couple of different uh, things that they looked at is, well, what if we use the future promise and the dot then? Um, and it turns out that there is a little bit more code and you need to handle a lot of different states. Uh, alternatively, you could try to implement um, a state machine yourself, right? So you write, uh, and this is actually like a very beautiful, correct implementation. Well, this is not the complete implementation. This is just the beginning of it. But if you do something like this, then it's very uh, easy to reason about it. So like that you haven't started connecting, you're attempting to connect, the error happened and so on. Uh, so this is wonderful, uh, but uh, handcrafting this code can get very tedious. Um, so the simpler thing to do would be to go back to the synchronous code that you wrote and uh, transform it into uh, using coroutines. So the latest uh, TS uses the co underscore uh, keyword. So there is co await, co yield, and uh, there's one more that I'm uh, blanking on. So um, this is pretty much the synchronous code that you've written previously, but now it, uh, it is uh, suspending at the right place. And uh, apparently it also performs really well. So uh, comparing that handcrafted state machine versus the coroutines, um, they, uh, the coroutines perform much better out of the box. Then, uh, so that's, that's a really nice talk by Gore Nishanov. Like, I, I would recommend uh, checking it out. Uh, so that uh, talk is called the coroutines and negative overhead abstraction, right? And so the reason it was called the negative overhead abstraction is because the compiler was able to perform uh, certain optimizations and uh, eliminate a lot of the code, right? So the more code there is to run, the slower something is going to run, right? And um, so just uh, the straightforward implementation, the coroutines were faster um, and resulted in a smaller uh, binary size. Um, then uh, the, uh, he performed some additional optimizations. So like use the sync completion, you know, like added a couple of flags there. And uh, it did improve the speed of the handcrafted code, right? That's handcrafted uh, state machine, but it also significantly improved the performance of the coroutine code. Um, and finally, he did some additional uh, work in order to uh, deal with the memory allocation, right? And so then uh, it uh, resulted in further improvements, but the coroutines were still performing significantly better. Um, and um, in uh, the C++ implementation, the coroutines are shifted to, um, to the optimizer stage of the compiler, right? So the compiler uh, starts with the front end, has the optimizer in the middle, so it translates from the, um, from the C++ code into this um, intermediate rep representation, then uh, the optimizers, various optimizers can uh, take uh, turns making the code more efficient, and then there is a backend where you generate the uh, final code. So by, uh, C Sharp and Python implement um, the coroutines in the front end, right? Uh, but by pushing the implementation of the uh, coroutines into the optimizer, uh, C++ was able to uh, achieve some uh, really nice effects, right? So uh, the uh, coroutines are just treated as generalized functions, and so depending on the situation, they will get translated into the appropriate code. And uh, so uh, behind the scenes, like this is kind of like a very uh, straightforward transformation of a uh, 
uh, coroutine, right? So like there are a couple of additional calls that you didn't have to write, but behind the scenes, the compiler inserted those for you. But because it is done in the uh, optimizer, occasionally, so like in one of the demos, uh, the coroutine example that was just going over and calling the coroutine four times, they re uh, removed all of the coroutine uh, calls and they just inserted three print, uh, or the four times, right, to four uh, print statements directly, right? So the uh, compilers are doing some amazing optimization work, so why not uh, take advantage of all of that? Yeah. Oh, this is a little bit out of place, but uh, the coroutine state is uh, like just, yeah, like so it's the additional context that you have. So um, the, in the case of uh, C++, it uses the promise or the future uh, of some sort, and there is some additional information. Uh, so the thing that um, was really interesting to me, though, is that uh, C++ is now relying on LLVM in order to uh, perform the coroutines. And the big uh, reason that this is exciting is because, well, so like LLVM now has all of these uh, intrinsics. So you, uh, like you can tell from the names, you can uh, start a coroutine, suspend it, then destroy and uh, resume it. Uh, and there are several additional uh, sets of intrinsics that um, LLVM supports. But what this means is that any language that uh, uses LLVM can now support coroutines. So here's an example in C. Um, so because C does not have the concept of the coroutines or futures and so on, uh, the return type of this function is just void star, right? So it kind of like hides that. And so like now you can call this from other um, uh, C code that is not aware of the coroutines. You just need to pass this coroutine state around, you know, somehow. Uh, but uh, this code gets translated into this LLVM intermediate representation. So you can see uh, like a couple of, um, yeah, like the LLVM coro, suspend, begin, and so on. Uh, so the, uh, the fact that any language can opt into uh, perform, uh, using the LLVM coroutines means that everybody gets to benefit from the same implementation that C++ is using. And so here's another uh, example in C. So you have a couple of, uh, yeah, so you can create your own macros that hide some of that complexity. And uh, so here you can see a couple of uh, like implementation details. So the coro begin macro uh, takes the memory allocator as a parameter because you need to uh, manage the memory. And so it says like, we'll use malloc and the coro end uh, takes the parameter. It's like, what, what do you use for cleaning up the memory? So uh, those things are a little bit more explicit in uh, C code, but you still get uh, to take advantage of all of that. And so then, oh, this is the example I was talking about. So here you can see that um, we uh, call the coro resume uh, four times, like on this particular coroutine. So the compiler um, was able, the optimizer was able to uh, determine that. So it unrolled the loop and it also determined that uh, that particular uh, code doesn't, is not really doing anything other than uh, printing the statement and it uh, returned this result. So pretty exciting. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know a whole lot about the Kotlin compiler. And so like in the future, I'm gonna uh, look into that. I don't know where uh, Kotlin does the uh, coroutine transformation, but that would be an interesting point of comparison. Maybe the Kotlin native compiler will use the LLVM coroutines, who knows? Well, so anyway, um, this is kind of like a little summary of uh, like a few things that I, uh, noted uh, some of the differences between the languages. Uh, so some languages use just a couple of uh, keywords to modify the function or to um, indicate the call site. So Kotlin chose to do it slightly differently, but uh, there are a few things that uh, Kotlin shifted uh, to the uh, library. And in fact, some other languages also had a similar uh, idea of, uh, so some of the semantics of how coroutines are used, for example, in C++ are uh, delegated to the library designers. So that way they can uh, make the determination of exactly how this library is going to transform uh, the code. All right, so this is, uh, this is all I have. I, uh, yeah, like I uh, encourage all of you to check out the talks on the coroutines if you haven't started using them um, in your applications yet. And I'm ready to take any questions. Okay. Thank you.